The Rolling Stones' I Can't Get No Satisfaction is really the first big breakthrough hit for the Stones in this country. Up to the period uh, in 1965 when, they, when, when this record broke in this country, they had hits in the UK and they were a much bigger deal there, but they had to work a lot harder than a lot of the British invasion groups uh, in 1964 uh, had to work uh, to get onto the charts here. I mean, they, uh, they didn't have as much success initially as groups, certainly not nearly as much success initially as the Beatles had, but they didn't really even have as much success as groups like um, the Animals, uh, Jerry and the Pacemaker, uh, Pacemakers, uh, Billy J. Kramer, uh, the Dave Clark Five, even Herman's Hermits um, had a little bit more uh, success than the Rolling Stones initially. But once I Can't Get No Satisfaction broke through and they became a big thing, of course, they became much bigger and much more long-lasting than any of those other groups uh, except the Beatles. So when we think about that British invasion, we typically think about it as Beatles, Stones. Um, their image very much crafted by their manager, Andrew Luke Oldham, to be the bad boys as opposed to the Beatles who were the good boys. And so this sort of market differentiation, a very big part of the, uh, of the way that the, the group was marketed. And it also fit with their personality and with their musical approach, which was much more blues oriented and a little less of a kind of polished vocal sort of song oriented kind of approach that the Beatles uh, used. So in many ways, if the Beatles were Atlantic records uh, from the late 1950s, uh, the Stones were more like chess records uh, from the late 1950s. And I Can't Get No Satisfaction is a great uh, instance of that. Um, song written by Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. They did not originally have the idea of writing their own songs like Lennon McCartney did. They had to be talked into it by their manager, Andrew Lou Goldham, who you know, explained to them, that's where all the real money is in this business. And so they started writing their own songs. And this was the, the, the first one to really have a tremendous amount of success if, since, since then, have, have, have sort of written uh, many of their, of their big hits and are thought of as important songwriters. Uh, the song itself is in a contrasting verse-chorus kind of form. It's a funny kind of verse-chorus form because the chorus actually sounds musically a lot more like a verse should sound, and the verse actually sounds a lot more like a chorus should sound. Early on, the Beatles, unlike the Stones, were not so aware of the ways in which songwriters had traditionally organized their material. And neither so much was Andrew Lou Goldham, who produced some of these sessions. And so many, in many ways, their, their early songs are, are uh, a little bit... Um, idiosyncratic in terms of the way they use form, much less so, uh, much, much more idiosyncratic and they use, they use traditional forms much less uh, than the Beatles did. When uh, we talk about Beatles, we talk about AABA forms coming back again and again and again here. Not so much with the music of the Rolling Stones and you wonder, well, what accounts for the success of it then? Why does it work? Well, because Mick and Keith have fantastic musical instincts. And so while I can say this is a contrasting verse chorus song that doesn't really work like a lot of other contrasting verse chorus songs because of the character of each of the sections, the song works because they have fantastic musical instincts. Um, one of, two important things for us to think about as we listen to the tune is this is one of the first important uses of the fuzz tone. And if you listen, just before, um, I think it is the second chorus, um, well, at some point between the sections, I can't remember exactly where it is, if you listen carefully, you can actually hear Keith hit the switch on the fuzz tone. You hear a little click sound as he hits the switch for the fuzz tone to go on and off. It's, it's, it was a little box you put on the floor to make the guitar sound all distorted and interesting. And this was sort of the very beginnings of, of using sort of, of pedal board kinds of effects back in the 60s. And so this is a great example of that. Um, the, the other thing that's important is that the songs were seen, the, song, the lyrics to the song were seen as potentially um, uh, controversial. Um, and that they, that they might deal with um, a person, um, the most polite way of saying this would be giving himself personal sexual pleasure. Um, and when the rumor came out or when word, the, the word came out that maybe this might be what the song was about, the Stones played it very cleverly. Um, they, didn't, they didn't deny it, but they didn't not deny it. And when, when Mick was asked, well, was the song, you know, what's the song about? He would say, well, it's about dissatisfaction in a number of areas of life. And this really, really helped support their bad boy image. There was nothing about it anybody could point to that showed that it was sort of dealing with taboo sexual kinds of things. And so they were able to get away with it. And don't forget, this was not too long after the big Louie Louie 
uh, controversy. Was there, you know, was there foul language in Louie Louie? You know, they brought in the U.S. government to try to listen to tapes and figure that out. So the idea of having a song that was controversial this way was, was, was not new at that time. And the Stones played it just right. Um, and with I Can't Get No Satisfaction had their first big hit in this country. The first of many, many more to come.